So welcome back everyone. So we have our next keynote talk by Victor Stinner. So Victor is a Python developer for nine years and he is currently working at Red Hat. Victor has, has been contributing to open source software since 2002 and was nominated for Google Open Source Peer Bonus. One of his greatest projects named OpenStack was nominated for the Infinite Rebase Shed in April 2016. Victor is also the author of Piper, Pulp, Handler, and Trace Model Modules. What do you, Victor? The stage is yours now. So hi, everybody. My name is Victor Stiner. I'm working for Red Hat, and I'm here to talk about the Python performance, the past, present, and future. And um, I'm going to shut down the, the video because I have some upload issues. Python performance. There are multiple implementation of the Python language. There is uh, C Python, which is the most famous because it was the first and it is also the reference implementation nowadays. This one was created by Guido van Rossum. Uh, it was created 30 years ago. After this one, uh, Jim Eginin created a G Python, later recalled, um, uh, renamed J just Jiden. This one is written in the Java language uh, and C Python is written in uh, in C. After this one, uh, Stackless Python was created by Christian Tismer for a different purpose. The idea is to run different coroutines in, um, in uh, not in parallel, but to it's a concurrent programming. It's very similar to AsyncIO, but using a different implementation. There is also Aaron Python created also by Jim and Jim Huguenin, and this one, this one is written in C Sharp using the Microsoft uh, CLR. So first target, targeting Windows. And more recently, there is a new implementation called MicroPython by Damien George. And this one is targeting embedded devices with very low uh, disk space and very low memory. Uh, which means la, uh, less than one megabyte of memory. This project is very popular, and you, I think, uh, it was the same the one running in the lighting talk just before. So there are different um, di different projects to optimize Python since uh, the creation of uh, C Python. The first one was created by Armin Rigo, and it's called uh, Psycho. The idea was to annotate one specific function and to, to optimize it when you execute it multiple times. So after a specific number of uh, execution, the, the function is optimized by, by a JIT compiler. But uh, Armin understood that this design is not um, is not efficient enough to make a, a Python application like uh, two times faster. So he created a new project called the PyPy. And uh, this one is very, very different because it's a new implementation. There was a project uh, started by two employees of uh, Google called Unladen Swallow. The goal of the project was to, was to make Python application running for uh, four or five times uh, faster, and they decided to use uh, LLVM. Another project started by one or two employees of uh, Dropbox was called uh, is called um, Python, and there is also a project uh, started by two employees of uh, Microsoft called uh, Pigeon. So you can see that there are many, there was many attempts to optimize Python. And I would like to, to notice that um, many of these projects, I mean, all, all of these projects except PyPy have an end, end date. And the end date means that um, the project development stopped for some reason. 
and we will see why uh, they they stopped. So there are two two main approaches to optimize Python. The first one is to take the existing C Python, fork the project, and attempt to implement your optimization. And the other approach is to write a new implementation from scratch. So for the first approach, uh, forking C Python, there are there are unladen swallow, ah, sorry, unladen swallow, piston and pigeon, which uh, took this approach. But uh, one of the um, of the drawback is that the performance will be limited by the old C Python design. And again, C Python was created 30 years ago. For example, there is a specific memory uh, allocator. There is a specific way to store uh, object memory, the C structures. The, um, there is reference counting to manage uh, object uh, lifetime, which means a specific garbage collector, a specific way to detect when the object are, are dis um, should be destroyed. And one infamous limitation of uh, CPython is also the global interpreter lock, known as uh, GIL. And uh, because of the GIL, CPython cannot run more than one thread and at the same time. The second approach to optimize Python is to write a new implementation from scratch. And uh, for example, there, there are PyPy, Jiton, and Aaron Python, which took this approach. And the great, great thing with this approach is that, for example, Jiton and Aaron Python have no GIL at all, which means that you can really run many threads in parallel, and um, the threads are running on multiple CPUs at the same time. It's not concurrent programming, but really uh, parallelism. Another nice thing is that you can use a very different uh, way to implement Python. For example, PyPy uses an efficient tracing garbage collector. It doesn't use reference counting. And the nice thing with a tracing garbage collector is that the object can, can move in memory, so you can uh, you can shrink the memory to reduce the memory footprints when you deallocate many objects. And also that um, reference counting as a, as a drawback is that when you run two Python uh, threads in parallel or even more, the reference counting can, can become a, a bottleneck because uh, two different threads are accessing the same memory. And each time that you have a race race connection, you have to protect the memory by uh, atomic operation or locks. So the tracing of garbage, sorry, the reference counting is not efficient for parallelism. But uh, this approach as a main drawback is that um, C Python is very famous for for C extensions like a NumPy, for example. And uh, this implementations written from scratch have no support of the extension or limited support. And even if they support the C extension, usually it's uh, slower than uh, C Python because the C API is not native, but they have to emulate the C API. For example, for the case of PyPy, there is a module called the CPy extension which creates a CPython a Pi object on the band. And this object has to be synchronized with PyPy objects. For example, uh, imagine that you have a list which is using a very efficient uh, storage uh, for, for PyPy. Uh, it, should, it is efficient for the JIT compiler. It is efficient for, to reduce the memory footprint. But uh, the first time that you use a CAPI on this list, PyPy has to convert the whole list uh, to, to C Python Py object, which is using more memory, and they are less efficient for the PyPy JIT compiler. And uh, the conversion from um, PyPy to C Python layouts requires to 
to copy memory, but also to convert the, the values so it's not efficient. Another issue with um, the other implementation of, Py of Python is that when you have a different implementation, you are in competition with CPython. CPython project has around 30 active core developers to maintain it. And a bunch of uh, core developers are even paid to do that, which means that they are working for companies who allow them to spend, for example, one day per week to maintain Python. In my case, I'm um, I'm paid by Red Hat to maintain a Python upstream, but also downstream on Fedora on Rare. And um, the new features um, are coming in uh, Python 3.9 or Python 3.8, etc., that you can uh, see in uh, the what's new documents of uh, what's new in Python 3.9, for example. There is a long list of new features, and all of these features are first um, implemented in C Python, which means that uh, C, uh, which means that PyPy, for example, has to re-implement all these features, but with a smaller team. So what you can see is that PyPy is already always a little bit late in terms of uh, Python version and Python features compared to C Python. I think that today they are supporting Python 3.6, and there is a beta version of PyPy supporting Python 3.7. And on the other hand, CPython is going to be released in version 3.9 in a few days, like next Monday, I hope. So the question is now, why would users prefer an outdated and incompatible implementation of Python? And who is going to sponsor the development of a different implementation of Python? In the case of the Unladen Swallow project, uh, created nine years ago by uh, Google employees, the nice thing is that they wrote a report explaining why they stopped the development of the project. And I identified three main reasons. The first one is that most Python code running at Google isn't performance critical, which means that the performance critical code it was written in a different language and Python is not really uh, the bottleneck. So there is a little benefit to, to make Python really faster. The deployment of uh, Python and Unland and Swallow was too difficult. Being a replacement was not enough to make Python uh, more popular at uh, Google. And our potential customers eventually found other ways of solving their performance problems. And this is something that we see often in uh, Python, is that Python uh, is not the most efficient uh, programming language, but there are many ways to work around this limitation. So at the end, Python itself, the Python interpreter, like a C Python, uh, is not the, the first target when you would like to optimize something. In the case of uh, Python, the project created by uh, Dropbox three years ago, there was also a report explaining why the development has stopped. And I identified two main reasons. The first one is that Dropbox has increasingly been uh, written, writing its performance sensitive code in other languages, such as Go. And um, the other reason is that uh, we spend much more time than we expected on compatibility. This is also an issue that I am seeing uh, often in other, other impl implementation of Python is that there are many ideas to optimize Python to make it more efficient. But when you optimize uh, something, it's not uncommon that you change the behavior in a subtle way. And uh, the issue is that the large project like Django are really based on the assumption that the Python behaves exactly as, as a C Python. So when you optimize something, you have to really behave exactly as a C Python. And this is something that the PyPy developer uh, 
pay, they paid a lot of attention to really mimic the exact behavior of C, of C Python, and they spend significant time to really be exactly um, compatible with with C Python. So the summary of the, the past section is that C Python remains the reference implementation, but it shows its age. So there are multiple optimization projects, but they almost all of them failed. And the remaining one, Piper, it's a drop-in replacement of C Python, and it's around four times faster, but it's not widely adopted yet. So the question is why? So let's move on to the present section, the present of a Python performance. So to optimize your code, uh, the first thing to, to consider is that you, you have to identify the bottleneck of your application. And let's say that you identify your, your bottleneck. So the question is that, how can you optimize this, this uh, bottleneck? How can you make your code running faster? The first thing that you have to, have to do is to, to just try PyPy, because PyPy just works. PyPy is a drop-in replacement for CPython. It's around four times faster than CPython in average. But I would like to, to add that the exact speed up really depends on your your work uh, your workload. So it depends on um, on what which code is running, how your code is designed. But the great thing is that PyPy is fully compatible with uh, C Python. And what I heard from PyPy is that sometimes uh, there is a small part of your application which is which is running slower than, um, than on C Python. And in this case, you can ask PyPy developers for help, and they can um, explain you how to make your code more efficient on, on PyPy. But there are some issues with PyPy. The, the main one is that the support of C extension using the CPy extension model is uh, almost as efficient as on CPython, but sometimes it's slower. The great news is that uh, two years ago, they organized a sprint, and they managed to heavily optimize the code. But again, it's still slower than CPython. And I would like to, to, to discuss the C API later to explain this issue. Another issue with uh, PyPy is that um, because of the JIT compiler, the memory footprint of your application is larger when you use PyPy than when you use CPython. It can be an issue if you would like to, sp to spawn uh, many processes on your server, and your server has a limited amount of memory. And uh, another last and uh, last issue, which I would say a, a minor issue, is that when you use PyPy, the startup time, the, the time just to start your application is usually longer because, again, the JIT compiler. If your, server, if your application is running for hours or for days, uh, you will not notice and it's just fine. But uh, there are many usage of Py Python, and some people are using Python for command line um, command line pro programs, which are running for a few seconds. And in this case, the start and time can be a bottleneck. Another common way to optimize Python is that once you identify your bottleneck of your application. Um, it's common that you you only identify a few files or a few few classes or functions, and you can you can start with uh, specific uh, functions and try to rewrite them in the C language or REST by writing a C extension or REST uh, extension, and by doing that you can uh, you can write way more efficient code, because in C, you can make more assumption and you can uh, use more efficient way to, to implement the same feature. And today, REST is becoming more and more popular, 
and there are two ways to write REST extension. The first one is REST C Python. The other one is a PI03. I never tried this one, so I cannot uh, say which one's the best. So just try out and uh, make your own opinion on that. The nice property of REST is that um, the, the REST compiler provides a warranty that if you write properly your code using the REST memory model, the compiler can tell you in advance that you, your, your program will not have memory errors like buffer overflows. There are many ways to ensure that there is no race condition. And this is really a, a great, great feature of the REST language. But uh, you need REST to C Python or Pyo3 to for the glue between uh, Python and REST. And for example, the Mercurial project, which is a source tracking um, as NCM source control management, similar such as uh, Git, but written in Python. For the Mercurial project, there are uh, some functions which are using heavily the CPU, so which are CPU bound. And in that case, it's uh, very interesting to rewrite some part of in REST. So there is an ongoing effort to rewrite the performance, performance bottleneck of Mercurial in REST. And so far, the, the project is quite successful. So let me come back to the, to the infamous global interpreter lock called uh, the GIL. So in C Python, there is a, a lock which prevents you to run um, many threads in parallel, but it depends on your, your workload. In the case of uh, mathematical functions, or uh, I would say in general, uh, pure Python code, which is described as, as a CPU bound. CPU bound means, means that the, the performance of your application is not limited by the input and output, the I.O., but it is only limited by the speed of your CPU. So for a CPU bound workload, um, Python is not, C Python is not efficient because you can only run a single thread in, um, at the same time. Even if your machine has, has a free CPUs and you wrote your code using threads, to so run them in, in parallel. In practice, using C Python, uh, there is no parallelism. Uh, there is only concurrency. It's one thread after the other. So if you imagine a machine with three threads and three CPUs, here the efficiency is only one, one third. But the GIL is not a, a, a bottleneck for any, any workload. If your application has a threads and the threads are more I.O. bounds, for example, one thread is reading a file, another thread is computing the SHA-1 checksum of the file contents, and a third thread is uh, compressing this data using bzip2. Uh, if you have this kind of workload, you are not limited by the CPU, it's more limited by, it's, um, in this case, you can release a GIL, and if you release a GIL, you can really uh, have a parallelism and execute all threads in parallel. So if you imagine a machine with three threads and three CPUs, in that case, you have an efficiency of uh, 100%. If your workload is really uh, CPU bound, there is one uh, simple solution, which is called the multiprocessing module. If you use a multiprocessing module, you can have one thread per process and run many, many processes in parallel. And thanks to that, the operating system is able to execute the process in parallel and really use the power of all use CPUs of your machine. And the multiprocessing module uh, makes, make, um, is making that uh, easy. So you don't have to manage the process uh, yourself. The multiprocessing takes, takes care of uh, spawning the process, sending the data, um, retrieving the results, and stop the process when the workload is done. Thanks to the multiprocessing uh, module, uh, 
For CPU bound workload, you can have again an efficiency of 100%. And this module is existing is already existing in Python for many years, so it's a, it's a ready ready to use solution. So the multiprocessing model uh, it works around the deal limitation, the global interpreter lock. And the great news is that in Python 3.8, release one year and a half, uh, release one year ago, sorry, you can get shared memory. And shared memory means that uh, you don't have to ser serialize and copy the memory between the different workers. You can just use a chunk of memory which is accessible by all, all the workers. And thanks to that, there is no memory copy um, anymore. So it's way more efficient for very large amount of memory, like a uh, very large uh, matrix in uh, NumPy. And the second great news is that, again, in Python 3.8, there is a new PyCal uh, protocol, the PyCal version, version 5. Again, and this new version avoids uh, copying very large objects. It's a PEP 7.5.7.4. The idea is that you can decide how you send a large amount of, uh, of memory. And for example, you can uh, delegate uh, the, um, the serialization using shared memory. So you don't have to, to copy the memory. You can write your own code to decide how to, to send the, the data. Uh, previously, I said that one way to optimize a function is to rewrite it in the C language, the C extension. But if you use uh, the C API of C Python, it can be very boring because you have to manage the memory yourself. You have to manage the um, reference counting. You have to manage uh, the exception, check for failures of each function. And the C language is uh, less, um, it, it takes more time, more lines to do the same thing than in Python. So the idea of uh, the Python project is that you write code such as Python. So this, the syntax of your code is very similar to Python, but you add a few annotation. And thanks to this annotation, the Python is able to, to produce way more efficient code than you, than you would get if you write it in Python or in C yourself. And uh, the great thing with Cyton compared to using directly the C API is that if you use Cyton, you can easily support multiple Python versions and also get a better support of PyPy or other Python implementation using the same code base. So you don't have to, to manage the very subtle differences of the C API between the different Python versions. And the other nice uh, property of uh, Cyton is that you don't have to handle the reference counting uh, manually. Cyton is doing that for you. And also the, um, the handling the exceptions on other many things which are very boring. So you, you don't have to write all this boilerplate code. And um, the last great property of uh, Cyton is that the, optimize, the Cyton optimizer emits uh, efficient code using CPython internals for you. So you don't, know, you don't have to know how CPython is implemented. Cyton does that for you. And thanks to the knowledge of the CPython internals, CPython, uh, Cyton, sorry, is able to produce way more efficient code than the code that you write, would write yourself. Another project to optimize your code is uh, Numba. Numba is uh, different, is more specialized to scientific um, applications. Uh, for example, code using a NumPy. So Numba is a JIT compiler translating a subset of Python and NumPy into fast code. And there are many, many ways to execute the same code faster. There are different uh, implementations. 
there is a simplified threading, which is a way to run threads, but the threads are releasing the gear. So if you recall uh, what I explained previously, what, if you release the gear, you are able to use all the CPUs of your machine and you get a parallelism. Numba is also able to emit a single instru instruction multiple data uh, vectorization, which is a way to run the same code way more efficient. There are many CPU uh, extensions for that, like uh, SEC, IVX, IVX uh, 512. And the last way to optimize the code is the uh, famous GPU acceleration like uh, NVIDIA CUDA, but then uh, Numba also supports AMD Hawk M, which is uh, another way to run your code on the GPU. And uh, all the solutions are way more efficient than the code um, that you would run uh, usually using a NumPy, for example. And the very nice thing with Numba is that you don't have to rewrite all your code from scratch. What you have to do is just to annotate a few functions using a decorator, and um, that's it. To come back to, to C Python, uh, there is a, a website called speed.python.org, which is tracking the performance of Python uh, over time. And the really nice tab is a timeline where you can see the performance over the last five years. Here is an example of a Telco benchmark, which is a benchmark on the decimal module. It's a benchmark to, to compute uh, sums of uh, numbers for, um, for um, a common, uh, common benchmark called the Telco. And you, here you can see that over five years, the performance of Python is becoming uh, way better, which is a great thing that we don't regress, but uh, become more efficient. And I spend a lot of time to, to make this benchmark more, more stable, because previously we got a lot of noise in the results, a lot of uh, spike, uh, faster or slower. So what I did is to write a new module called uh, PyPath, which is a way to run the benchmark differently to get more stable uh, results and more rep reproducible uh, results. And after that, I modified the C Python benchmark suite called PyPerformance. I modified it to use PyPerf. And thanks to that, now the results are more and more stable, so it's easier to, to use a result to take a decision. In summary, for the present section, PyPy doesn't require any code change, so you have to test PyPy on your code and uh, see that it's faster. If you identify your, the bottleneck of your, of your application, you can attempt to rewrite a few specific functions as a C or REST extensions. Multiprocessing scales. Uh, it really enable parallelism on many CPUs, and it, it, is, it is easy to use. To write C extension, use site and please don't use the C API directly. And num Numba makes NumPy faster. Okay, we saw a lot of existing solution to make your Python code faster. And I would like to, to, to show you a few uh, experimental projects to attempt to optimize Python even more. I spend a lot of time to analyze uh, why C Python is slow and why other optimization project failed in the past. And I think that I, I identify one big reason, which is the C API of C Python. The C API um, evolved organically which means that uh, internal functions are exposed by mistake. And this C API uh, was first written to be consumed by C Python itself. There was no uh, overall design. So 
the design is just expose everything and don't think about if it's a good idea or not. And 30, 30 years ago, it was just, um, just simple and good enough. But uh, what we get today is that the C API expose way too many implementation details. And because of that, it's way more difficult to optimize by them. So in Python 3.8, I did uh, many changes in, on the C API, and I'm still working on that in Python 3.9 and, uh, and, the, in, and the next Python 3.10. And one big change of Python 3.8 is that instead of having a single API at the same place where you get private function, internal function, and public function, I, I split this API in three parts. So the main include directory is a public stable C API. The C Python sub directory is a C API specific to C Python. And the in internal uh, uh, sub directory is an internal C API. So this API is only, should only be used by C Python itself. But I decided to expose it anyway for very specific use case, such as a, a debugger or a profiler, which has to inspect uh, the, the object of Python without executing Python. Because a debugger should not modify the state of an, uh, an application, but only inspect uh, what is the current uh, state. And uh, many private functions uh, with a prefix on underscore pi and the pi interpreter state structure have been moved to the internal uh, C API in Python 3.8. Another uh, interesting thing in Python is a stable ABI. The idea of the stable ABI is to support multiple Python version, for example, Python 3.8, 3.9, and later uh, the next Python 3.10 using a single binary. So the idea is that you build your C extension once and you can use the same binary on multiple Python version. So for example, for a Linux vendor, instead of having one package for Python 3.8, one package for Python 3.10, uh, which becomes annoying when you would like to support, for example, 10 versions of Python, Thanks to the stable ABI, uh, you are able to ship a single uh, package, a single binary, and support um, a large number of Python versions. So what changed in uh, Python 3.8 is that uh, the debug build is now ABI compatible with the release build, which is really interesting for debugging purpose, because when you get a crash in Python, it's very likely that the crash doesn't come from uh, Python code, but more from the C extension. And if you use the debug build, you, you get way more sanity check uh, running at runtime to detect bugs. And thanks to this check, you, it, it's more likely to, that you get the explanation of, or more information about the crash. And the, thanks to this change, you can use your existing C extension compiled in release mode uh, using a Python uh, compiled in debug build. Because previously in Python 3.7, you had to recompile all your C extension. And that can be very uh, tricky if you get uh, many, um, many requirements, many dependency like header files or compiler or, specific, or something else just to build your, your C extension. So to come back to the C API and why it is an issue to expose the implementation detail, I would like to take the example of a specialized list. In C Python, a list is basically uh, an array of pointers, uh, an array of uh, pointers to Py objects, which is a real content of uh, one object. But in the PyPy, there is a strategy to get a specialized list. So if you consider a list of only, which only contains integers, uh, 
PyPy is able to store this list as, a, as an array of integers. So there is no indirection from the list to an, an object which is stored somewhere else in memory. Uh, you get directly the value of uh, the item directly in the list. And thanks to that, you get a lower memory footprint, but you also get a better performance because there is no indirection. So the CPU doesn't have to fetch the, the numbers from somewhere else. And the question is now, can this optimization be, be implemented in C Python? And can we modify the PyList object structure of C Python? And uh, the, the answer in short is uh, no, we cannot. The first problem is that uh, to access uh, an item of the list, there is a macro in the C API called PyList get item, and this macro access directly into the into the list, access directly the ob underscore item member of the PyList object, and uh, this this item is a pointer to a Py object, and the C extensions must not access the PyList object members directly. Because if you do that, you get um, you you expose the the direct memory layout, and you cannot change the layout. Because if uh, your machine code is accessing directly the memory to a specific offset, if you change the memory layout, instead of getting a pi object uh, star, you get a number or something else, and your program is going to just crash. So the, the PyList get item macro could be modified to convert uh, the, the number of a specialized list to a Py object star, but there is a second issue with that. And the second issue is called the borrowed references. If we come back to the macro PyList Py get item, let's imagine that we implemented the specialized list. So in C Python, a list is made only on numbers. And when you access an item of the list, the macro magically uh, creates an object on demand. But if you do that, you get a borrowed references, which means that the, the list doesn't know when the caller is still using the object returned by the macro or when the object can be destroyed. This is a borrowed references. And you must not use a pi decref to decrement the reference counter of the object. You must not use it on the object. That means that if the macro creates an object, the list doesn't know when uh, this temporary object can be destroyed. And this is a this is an issue for the for the correctness, but also an issue for the performance because you can keep an object alive longer than uh, what it should be. We don't know when the object can be destroyed, and this is an issue. And sadly, many fun C functions of the C API are returning borrowed references. So we can, we can do a better C API. And for that, um, one, one thing is to do is to to make the structure opaque, which means to, to prevent C extension to access directly members of the structure. Mm -hmm. And instead of accessing directly into the structure, we, we have to use a function call. Because a function call is hiding the, how the, the members are stored in memory. So for example, when you create an object in Python using pylong from, from long, you get an object. Uh, but currently, you can directly access the ob underscore type member of the object to get this type. And this is an issue. We, we should not be able to do that. We should hide uh, the way to retrieve the type of an object using, for example, the pi underscore type macro. The second thing to do is to remove functions uh, using borrowed references. 
or functions which steal references, which is another uh, issue similar to borrowed references. And as I said, we, we have to replace macros with uh, function calls. So the, um, when you build your C extension, the C extension will only call functions on this function will uh, really do the work for you to hide the implementation, implementation details. Uh, but by doing that, there is one issue that people don't like is uh, breaking the backward compatibility because any C API change can break an unknown number of projects. And maybe not all C API design issues can be fixed. Um, we can try to fix a bunch of uh, C extension, uh, for example, the most popular C extension on PyPI, but uh, fixing all C extension on PyPI uh, can take uh, a lot of time or even infinite time. So maybe there is a, another way to, to fix this issue. There is another project called uh, HPI, which is a new C API. The idea of, of uh, HPI is to, to design the C API correct uh, since day one. Correct means that you, you hide the implementation detail and you design the C API such as it can run and is a in the most efficient way on C Python, but, um, but especially in a PyPy, because as PyPy has a, has a different constraint, has a different memory layout. And HPy, um, if you use HPy, the code is running way, way more efficient on PyPy. The, the base design of HPy is that there is no more uh, PyObject Py star, so there is no more pointer to PyObjects. The, the, this, this API is using PyHandle, and a handle is a, an opaque uh, integer, something that you cannot inspect. And you can see that um, such as a, a Unix file descriptor, which when you call, when you open a file on Unix, you get a number and you call function, you pass this number uh, to function, and the number is a, a, a private reference to an internal object in the Linux kernel, for example. Or you can also see that as a Windows handle. On uh, Windows, you can uh, you have also, uh, when you open a file, when you create a, a lock, when you, when you do many op operations, you get um, an opaque handle. And you only call functions on this handles. And the base operation uh, open to get a new handle, duplicate to, to copy an handle, and close the handle. And thanks to this uh, new um, API based on the Py handle, you, you get better performances. As, and the nice thing is that you can, you don't have to rewrite C, uh, C Python from scratch. You can just take the existing C API and implement HPy on top of the uh, existing C API of C Python. And this has been done. And there is a, a second implementation written for, especially for PyPy, which is take, making a, assumption on PyPy internals. And thanks to that, you can get more efficient code uh, if you write it using HPy. Uh, results and uh, performance that you would get if you use existing C API of, of C Python. And uh, I think it was last year they managed to rewrite a JSON parser using HPy, and the modified uh, JSON parser is running something like four times faster on PyPy than the implementation using the C API, the existing C API. And four times faster is really, really interesting. So it's a, it's a proof that the design makes sense and that there is another way to, to solve this issue. And uh, the great thing is that you, if your C extension is, uh, using, is written using Cyton, there is a way to not have to modify your code uh, 
because we can modify Cyton to generate scores using the, the new PyHandle for you, so using the HPy project. So the, there is a, an ongoing uh, work to, to modify Cyton to generate directly the HPy code, so you don't have to modify your C extension. So again, please don't write C, don't use the C API directly, just use Cyton. Okay, we'd like to, to come back to, uh, to an issue uh, of CPython, which is reference counting. Uh, the, the problem of the reference counting is that it is tied to the, to the global interpreter lock. And uh, to, to, to remove the global interpreter lock, the reference counting becomes an issue. So there is a project called the Gilectomy, uh, started by Larry Hastings which is uh, trying to remove the gill from CPython. The idea is to replace a unique gill with one lock per mutable object. Mutable means that you can modify an object in place, like a list, a dictionary, or a set object. And uh, for example, one way to do that is to, to implement the reference counting using atomic increments on decrement uh, instructions, CPU instruction. Atomic means that if two threads are running the, um, the instruction in parallel, the CPU ensure that the operation uh, is, there is no race, race condition. Um, to, to implement the gilectomy, the um, Larry tried to, to create a log of uh, in-cref or decref uh, operation, and by doing that, um, it's possible to run the code faster in multiple threads, but the implementation is quite complicated, and uh, sadly, on Benchmark, this implementation was uh, didn't scale well. Instead of running uh, code faster than CPython, at the end it was running slower than CPython, which is the opposite of the goal of the overall project. So I would say that the whole uh, issue with the with the gill comes from the reference counting, and the reference counting doesn't scale with the number of threads. So what we should try to do in for CPython is to replace uh, the reference counting using a tracing garbage collector because many uh, more modern language implementation use a tracing garbage collector, like PyPy, for example. The idea is to be able to move objects in memory and to identify where the objects are stored in memory. And thanks to that, the, the code is able to run uh, faster in parallel. But for, for the existing C API, if we move to C, C Python to a tracing garbage collector, for the existing C API, they will continue to use reference counting for the external code, which will hide how the, the objects are stored in, in private, in internals, internally. And to finish, um, there is one cool project called Subinterpreters. There is a PEP written by Eric Snow, the PEP 554, multiple interpreter in the standard library. The idea is to replace a single uh, in global interpreter lock with one lock per interpreter, which means that uh, you can run multiple instances of Python in parallel. And by doing that, each interpreter gets the full speed of Python. So it becomes possible to run um, to run a separated uh, interpreter at a full speed and really scale with the number of CPUs. So there is a work in progress refactoring work of CPython, but it's uh, it's a long term project because it takes a lot of time to to modify all the existing code and to. Uh, to not break the backward compatibility. But I think it was in last May, I proved that on a, on a machine with uh, four physical CPUs and with four cores, it is able to run the code, um, I think, for, for up to two times or maybe four times faster 
using a modified uh, implementation of C Python using sub interpreters running in parallel. In parallel means one sub interpreter per CPUs. So I had an, an experimental implementation of that, and I proved that you get a similar speed or the same speed than multiprocessing, but inside the same process. And the nice thing is that uh, having a single process, it's more easy to, to manage because uh, managing um, a bunch of process can cause other issues like a larger memory footprint. So to, to, show you, to show you that, instead of having a single process and uh, multiple threads limited to one CPU per thread, so all threads of the same interpreter, you have um, using sub-interpreters, the idea is that each interpreter has its own threads and each interpreter is, is has a dedicated CPUs. So again, you get an efficiency of 100%. Five minutes left. Um, so there's the expectations of sub-interpreters is to get a lower memory footprints because we should be able to more to share more memory. We should get a faster locks because the locks are inside the same process. It's not a locks between two processes. But one of the limitations of sub-interpreters is, is that you cannot directly exchange Python objects between two interpreters. You, you, you have to design your application directly to not share objects. So the summary of the future of the Python performance is that uh, the currency API has uh, design issues. There is a new PyHandle API, uh, a new API called called HPy using uh, PyHandle, which is a work in progress. We should try to use a tracing garbage collector for CPython. And there is an exciting project, which is uh, to run sub-interpreters inside the same process. So to conclude, uh, there, are, there were many previous optimization attempts which failed. But uh, Cyton, multiprocessing, Numba, Numba, but also C and REST uh, extensions are working well to make your code faster. And HPy, tracing garbage collector, uh, and sub interpreters are very promising projects to optimize Python. So thank you all. I give you links to, to the different projects that I listed, like uh, PyPy my notes on uh, how to make C Python faster, the C, my notes on the Python C API, the, the speed project where we are tracking the performance of Python. There is also a mailing list uh, to discuss the uh, optimization project, speed uh, at python.org. And the last link is a link to the HPy projects. Uh, but I will not have enough time for questions so if we, you want, you can ask me questions on uh, Zulip. I am Victor Stiner, and thank you.